Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'm going to teach you how to create a new electronic puzzle based around one of these components. This is a 6 degrees of freedom sensor, or an MPU 6050, and it's the kind of kit that you might find uh, in your mobile phone, or in your tablet, or in a games controller, that detects um, movement and motion and orientation. So, um, you know, when you turn your phone around to landscape, mode and it kind of changes the device orientation or if you shake your controller this is the kind of chip that probably does that kind of recognition. So this is a six degrees of uh, freedom sensor so it actually combines two different sensors in one. It's got a gyroscope that measures uh, tilt in three different axes. It's also got an accelerometer that measures uh, a degree of force applied in three different axes. You can also get 9 degrees of freedom uh, sensors, they combine it with a compass. Um, you can get 10 degrees of freedom, which I think extends it to have like a pressure meter or something like that. So it's basically a number of different um, analog readings from some sensors here. And it's on a nice little breakout board, which means that you can easily wire it into an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. And that's what we're going to use as the input for a puzzle. Okay, so I've got my sensor on a breakout board, and that's wired up to my Arduino. And what I want to show you first of all is just the sort of the raw sensor output that I can read from uh, those six degrees of freedom. So if I turn on my serial monitor from uh, my Arduino, so what you've got there is six columns of information. I've got the acceleration in the X, Y and Z axes, and then I've got the rotation, uh, which is the yaw, pitch and roll. Uh, in the final three columns. So as I move the sensor around, what you can hopefully see at the moment is the corresponding column uh, of the rotation in that axis will be updated. And then if I suddenly apply a force uh, in a different axis, you'll see the first three columns of inflation get updated. So if we're going to give a good shake, those three values will get very high. And if I rotate it around, you'll see the final three columns. Now that's quite a lot of data to process though. Uh, so I think there's probably uh, an easier way to do it in a puzzle and that's probably just to concentrate only on the acceleration component for now. So for this puzzle I'm going to ignore rotation, I might use that in another puzzle in the future. But if I only look at the acceleration and even more so I'm not even going to consider the acceleration in different axes, I'm just going to look at the, uh, the overall maximum acceleration applied in any one axis. And if I do that I get something that looks more like this instead. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at a single value. So instead of uh, plotting it in the serial monitor as that kind of uh, uh, numeric value that's sort of in a table format, uh, I've decided to use the serial plotter function instead and plot it on a graph. Um, if you haven't used this feature before, it's a really useful uh, feature in the Arduino IDE. It just allows you to monitor the value of a single variable over time. Uh, so in this case, what I'm plotting is the, um, the maximum value of the acceleration reading in any axis. So if I try to hold the sensor as still as I can, what you should hopefully see is that line go flat. If I now give it a bit of a wobble, you'll see uh, pulses appear on that graph to show the reading of the acceleration. And if I now give it a really sharp shake, uh, you'll see the actual the uh, scale of the axis varies to be able to accommodate these sharp taps. But you can get a, a pretty good uh, degree of sensitivity uh, from those readings. So I'm now down to a single sensor value based on the amount of force which is being applied to this unit. And now I have to think of a, a puzzle that's going to incorporate that. Okay, so now it's time for me to actually show you this working in a puzzle. So what I've done is I've taken the uh, degrees of freedom sensor and I fixed it halfway up the pole of this um, kid's uh, punching bag thing. So this is on a spring unit at the bottom here. Uh, I could have mounted it right at the top, but I was a bit worried I was actually going to hit it, and I think I'll get uh, just enough readings from it being halfway up the pole there. So that's where it is. It's still wired to the Arduino, uh, which is now on the wall over here. Um, but you'll notice I've also got, uh, this is an, a NeoPixel strip of 30 LEDs going up the wall. So rather than now plotting the output of the um, accelerometer on a serial plot or an Arduino, I'm going to translate that into a number of LEDs to light up the wall. So as I hit this, depending on how hard I hit it, it'll go up down. So it's a bit like one of those kind of high striker machines that you get at the, uh, the fairground or the circus or something, where you've either got to punch the bag as hard as you can or you've got to hit it with a hammer and it'll go up at the top. 
There is a mag lock over here, which is currently uh, secured and locked with the plate on. And the idea being, so if this was a, a puzzle in an escape room or something like that, what you're going to have to do is punch this as hard as you can to make the LEDs light up all the way to the top. And if they do, that's going to release the mag lock and allow you to get it through the door. <clears throat> now, I'll give it again. It should be said, I'm a, I'm a nerd, I'm a, a sort of pacifist geek, I'm not very good at fighting or punching, so this might not go very well. But I'm going to try and hit this as hard as I can to get to the top and release the lock. We'll see how it goes. So, number one. Not bad, but it wasn't good enough. Okay, let's try again. A bit more, bit more force this time. Hey, there we go. And the, uh, the mag lock has fallen onto the floor. Okay, so that's the puzzle in action. Okay, so let me show you how this is all wired together. So over here on this side, I've got my MPU 6050 unit, and this is wired uh, from the top down. I have, first of all, a five volt uh, DC input. Uh, that's this red line here, and this is coming from the DC barrel jack at the top. Uh, you'll notice that that five volt supply is also being used to supply the uh, relay over here, and also going to the Arduino itself. And those three also share a common ground. So this black line here uh, is the ground line, which is going to ground on the Arduino to the negative marking on the relay. Uh, and then on this side, we've got the other ground pin on the Arduino connected to the ground on the sensor. So these three devices are all sharing a five volt supply and they're all sharing a common ground. Now, these next two lines, SCL and SDA, uh, these are part of an I2C or I squared C interface, uh, which is an inter integrated circuit interface. So, in some of my other projects, um, you might have seen that I've used an SPI interface. So, that's how you commonly um, attach an RFID reader, for example. And that has lines called MOSI and MISO and slave select and things like that. Well, this sensor uses uh, I2C instead, which is just a different sort of interface to go between um, electronic components. And this has uh, just two wires. It has a clock line, uh, which is this yellow one, and it has a data line, which is the blue one. Now, the thing is, though, those, like uh, SPI leads, have to go to particular pins on an Arduino. I2C also uses particular pins on an Arduino. So... Uh, the system clock line has to go to A5 and the data line has to go to A4. So you might think these pins um, normally as analog input pins, um, but if you want to use an I2C connection, um, they sort of have a dual function for that as well. Um, and then there's one more wire at the bottom here. This is the INT line. So INT stands for interrupt. And uh, what we're using that for... So Normally, if you have an input that you want to measure on your Arduino, let's say you have a button and you want to know whether it's pressed or not, what you might do is in your loop function, uh, you might um, sort of check on every frame whether that button is reading high, uh, if it's connected to 5 volts, for example, or low if it's connected to ground. And that's fine if you've got an input like a button that sort of doesn't change that often. But um, as you saw earlier, this kind of unit generates a lot of data very quickly. It has a fast throughput. And you don't always want to wait uh, every frame for that data to kind of be processed. What you want to do is for the uh, Arduino to receive that data straight away and act upon it. So that's what uh, an interrupt is for. Effectively, what it means is that rather than the Arduino having to uh, ask for the data every frame from the sensor unit, the sensor unit is actually pushing it to the Arduino and it's asking it to interrupt uh, whatever it might have been doing in the program loop at that time. When, when data is available, uh, the signal on this int line here is going to um, be sent and received on the Arduino and that's going to interrupt whatever it was doing. It's going to process the data that's been incoming and then it's going to go back to wherever else it was in the program. So that's why it's called an interrupt. And rather like uh, the I2C lines, which I discussed here, if you want to use an interrupt, you do have to do it on particular pins of the Arduino as well. So I'm using external interrupt um, zero, and that is mapped to digital pin two. So, um, you know, in some of my projects, I've kind of said, you know, you can plug this into any pins you want, and you just have to make a change in code. 
But for this particular example, it's pretty much fixed exactly how these pins need to be connected to the Arduino from the sensor. And then on the other side, um, this will probably look pretty familiar to you um, if you've seen any of my other projects. So I've got, like I said, a 5 volt relay that's being supplied with power and ground and a single signal line that's going to digital pin 3. Uh, when that signal line receives a high signal um, from the Arduino, it's going to mean that on the load side here, the common pin is going to flip across from normally closed to normally open. And that in turn is going to either allow or stop the 12 volt supply here being sent to the maglock. So um, initially the maglock is closed because the common pin is connected and this is circuit here between these two red lines. Uh, when the puzzle becomes solved, that common, flim, uh, common pin flips across and the maglock releases. And now let me talk you through the Arduino code. Uh, so there's quite a lot here, so I'll try to concentrate on the bits which I think are most important. So first of all, you'll notice that I'm using quite a few uh, libraries in this code. Now, all of these uh, ones here, certainly at the top, can be installed directly through the Arduino IDE. So if you just go to um, the sketch menu and then include library, manage libraries here, and then if you uh, search for the wire library, I2C dev, MPU 6050 and fast LED, you can install them uh, directly through that. Uh, this very final library, this is actually a custom one which I've written, um, I'll show you that in a minute, and that's just to calculate a running average. Um, so in turn, so wire, this is used uh, to communicate with I2C devices. Uh, this is an I2C specific library that kind of builds on top of the wire library. And then this library is even more specific. This is just about the particular sensor unit um, that we're using. Uh, fast LED, this is the one which I've used before to control the LED pixel strip. And like I say, this running average library contains some functions I wrote. Rather than uh, always displaying the current reading from the accelerometer, if you do that, you get quite a lot of um, noisy data. So I take a, an average of that just to kind of smooth it out. So uh, and the functions of that library are contained uh, separately from this code here. Okay, and then we'll do a couple of um, defines. So there are 30 LEDs in my LED strip. Um, the type of strip I'm using comes in 30 LEDs per meter sections anyway. So I've got one meter of LEDs and there's 30 of them. Uh, this is the debug mode, which will output some more data to the serial monitor. Um, now remember I said that we're using that external interrupt so that when new data is available from the accelerometer unit it's pushed straight to the Arduino without needing to have like a digital read done on the signal line or something like that. Uh, and the um, external interrupts on Arduino, uh, the first interrupt always is on digital pin 2. And then I'm using uh, the A2 pin, that's going to be my output pin, uh, which when all the LEDs are lit uh, that's going to be driven high. So that goes to my relay, which in turn controls the power that goes to the maglock. Okay, I've only got one constant this time, and this is something which I call activation force. Um, so the sensor reading comes in, and it's going to give me a value up to a maximum of, I think, 32,768. Uh, if the reading is greater than this value, though, I'm going to say that is the force that's needed to unlock the puzzle. So I've just arbitrarily set that at 20,000, depending on exactly how you set up your sensor and what you're hitting it with and all things, you, you'll want to sort of adjust that based on um, kind of evidence based on when you run the thing. Okay, we've got some uh, global variables as well. So this is the uh, variable that's gonna be the sensor itself. And when we receive uh, uh, sensor data, it's going to be added to a buffer. Uh, remember that data gets, there's quite a lot of data was being sent there and it's being sent quite fast. So we're going to store it in a buffer, uh, which is a first in first out buffer. Um, so that's going to have a maximum of uh, 64 bytes of data in it. And uh, the actual one packet of data is going to be 42 bytes big. And then we'll keep track of how much of the buffer is being filled up as well. So this is just a counter to say how many of those are currently being used with data. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to, rather than reading a value from 
the sensor unit, what we're going to do is we're going to let the sensor unit populate the buffer and then read uh, packets of data off that uh, FIFO buffer. Um, I'll show you that in the code later on. We've got an array of uh, RGB values, which is going to show the color uh, that the LED is going to be lit up. I mean, I'm just lighting them red for this example, but you can do any color you want. You can do chase patterns and nice sequences. And then we're going to initialize an object for that running average. And I'm going to take a running average of the last 30 values. Again, if you set a smaller a number there, you'll get kind of a more responsive uh, reading but it will also have more kind of jitteriness to it. If you set a, a longer value, it's going to be smooth over a longer period of time, which will be a smoother response, but also a slower response. And then here are the different uh, sorts of values which we're going to derive from the accelerometer measurement. So these are sort of a bit complicated, you don't need to worry too much about them. So a quaternion is a measure of uh, rotation, it's a 4D measure of rotation. Um, which we're going to read back. Gravity is a vector, obviously. And then we actually, we, we don't just take, uh, it's not as simple as sort of asking for the accelerometer reading and just getting a single value back. We actually have to do a little bit of transformation on that first. So this is kind of the raw accelerometer reading, which we're going to get x, y, and z uh, dimensions of. We're then going to adjust that to remove gravity, because obviously, remember, gravity is a there's a constant force that's going to be uh, included in that value there, but we want to adjust it to get rid of that. So that's what AA real does. We then need to adjust it again to take account of the orientation of the sensor. Um, I mean, gravity always acts downwards, but if the sensor's upside down, then it's going to appear to be acting upwards. So we have to adjust the reading again to account for the um, in-world space. So these are just kind of successive adjustments to the accelerometer reading until we get to the one that we really want, which is this one at the bottom. And then what we have here, um, so this is just a little kind of trigger uh, variable just to let us know that that interrupt has been triggered and some data has been received from the sensor unit. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the functions. And this first function here, this is the function itself, which is going to be attached to the interrupt and uh, it's going to set that variable I was just referring to there. So when you set uh, functions that are attached to an interrupt you want to keep them really small really fast to run because remember what this interrupt is going to do is it's actually going to interrupt the main program flow that's running uh, in the loop uh, function and you don't really want to divert the process away from that for too long you don't want to do a whole, a whole load of heavy lifting and complicated algorithms and things like that in an interrupt function. You want it to be really quick. So all this is doing is setting a single Boolean value, which is this one up here, saying to true, just so we know that uh, the interrupt message has been received and there is some new data available from the sensor to process. Okay. And then we're going to set up. So set up runs when the program first runs. What we're going to do is initialize a serial link. That's what's going to be used for our um, debugging information. We're going to initialize the relay pin, and initially that will be low. And then we'll just set through uh, various steps of setting up the sensor. So the first thing we do is we begin um, the I2C interface, which is going to use that wire library we saw at the beginning. So we begin, and we also set a clock speed, and I'm using uh, 400,000 hertz. Um, that should be fine. You can adjust that downwards a bit if you if you have kind of reliability issues, but that I find works well with me uh, on an Arduino Uno or Nano certainly. Um, and then once we've so that's initialized the I2C interface, then we initialize the uh, sensor itself. So we've got the the interface first of all, then the sensor, and then once we've got the sensor initialized, what we then need to do is uh, initialize the part of the sensor which is actually going to give us the accelerometer reading. So that's uh, called the digital motion processor or the DMP. So it's a, it's a slightly tricky setup routine because it's got sort of several stages. And then once we've initialized that, what we, what we need to do is, is to kind of zero out the readings. Now, um, in an earlier project, I used a um, HX711 load sensor to uh, measure an amount of weight that was placed on the end of a load bar and for that what you needed to do was uh, adjust it to have zero reading just like any digital scales you have to kind of zero them and it's a little bit like that here 
So what you need to do is to, there's an example sketch that comes with the MPU uh, library called IMU0. And if you run that sketch and let it run for quite a long time, it's like five minutes with the sensor on a flat surface as you're going to be using it, you'll come out at the end with some offset values of uh, the X, Y and Z for the gyroscope and for the accelerometer. And what you need to do is copy those values and place them into the sketch here instead. Um, and that will be the correct offset values so that then when your sensor is placed um, and it's not moving and it's the right way up, everything's going to read a zero, which is obviously what we want to do. Um, once that's all done, so we've initialized the sense, we've initialized the interface, we've initialized the sensor, we've initialized the DMP, we've set the offsets. Now we're actually going to uh, effectively turn the processor on. So we're going to set DMP enabled to true. And we're then going to attach the interrupt function, this DMP data ready function, which we defined uh, back up here. Remember this one here? We're going to attach that function to the uh, external interrupt pin. So we called that um, digital pin 2. Uh, slightly confusingly, there's a couple of different ways of referring to the pins on an Arduino. So the interrupt pin 0 corresponds to digital pin 2. So there's a little sort of helper function here that just kind of uh, translates between the different ways of referring to pins. But all this does is it says, okay, Whenever a uh, rising signal is detected uh, on this interrupt pin, we're going to fire that DMP data ready function. So that's just going to be our interrupt that says, hey, some data is available, and then we can do something with it. Um, so the packet size variable, so I initialized that near the top of the script as uh, 42 bytes um, up here, uh, which is the kind of the default standard. But um, if for any reason the, your sensor unit has a different value than that, um, this function here, DMP get FIFO packet size, will overwrite that with the correct value for your sensor unit instead. And that's all the initialization for the um, accelerometer sensor. So there's quite a lot there um, to get through, but it's, it's not too bad. All you're doing is kind of stepping through a series of initializations uh, one after another. Uh, and then it becomes a bit simpler again, so we're just going to initialize the uh, LED strip. Uh, so we're going to have number of LEDs, this is the array of LED objects, and that's going to be controlled by the A0 pin. And then, I'm not sure if this is strictly necessary, but it's probably good practice. So we've uh, declared a running average object that's going to have 30 readings in it, and we're just going to call the clear function just to explicitly clear out that uh, sort of buffer of average values just so we know we're definitely starting at zero. Okay, and then we get on to the loop function. So, uh, the first thing the loop function does is to actually see whether that MPU interrupt flag has been set or not. That's the flag that gets set when the interrupt uh, function is triggered, so when there's data available. And this bit here says, well, while there isn't any data available, so that exclamation mark at the end reverses this, do nothing. This is just going to leap round and round and round until that interrupt trigger has uh, recorded some new data being input. Okay. If it has done that, well, let's reset the flag so that next time the trigger gets set off, we know that some new data has arrived. We will uh, find out uh, how much information there is currently in the buffer. And then we'll check this. So it, this shouldn't happen. Um, but it's kind of included here just as a kind of a, a precaution, I guess. So if the uh, so if the count of bytes in the buffer here exceeds the size of the buffer, um, we've actually run into a buffer flow, a buffer overflow error. So we've received more data um, than we have been able to process, and it's just been backing up in this queue that we've set up. And obviously, we don't want to overwrite bytes um, beyond the size of the buffer. So if the number of bytes written in the buffer exceeds the size of the buffer, or uh, this function here is to say that um, the status returned by the processor unit is an error status as well. So if either of those two events has happened, we've, we've had a buffer overflow, and what we'll do is we'll just um, clean that buffer out, basically, very simply saying. So this shouldn't ever happen, but it's just there as a precaution just to prevent any accidental uh, memory overwriting or something like that. 
so if that hasn't happened, let's check whether there is at least as much data in the buffer than one packet's worth of data. So that means we know that we've got at least one whole packet's worth of data that's been received, which means we can get on with processing it. So we'll get um, the bytes from the buffer, and we'll get a packet's worth of bytes in the buffer, and we'll also reduce the count uh, correspondingly. So we'll say, okay, let's say there were, there were 30 bytes in there, theoretically speaking, and we want a 16 byte uh, packet of data, so we'll take 16 bytes off it, and then we'll reduce the total by 16 bytes, so we still know there's 14 left for next time. And then there's a series of uh, functions in turn here that remember that stepping through that series of uh, kind of adjustments to get the acceleration reader we want. That's what we do here. So the first thing we do is we get the uh, quaternion rotation value. Even though we're not actually using the rotation directly in this puzzle, so you don't have to rotate the thing for it to work, but we still need to get that value because that's going to let us know which way up the sensor is, which is going to help us adjust to gravity. Um, so that's why we're, we're retrieving it here, even though, uh, in a sense, we're not. I'm not asking the player to turn the unit over at all, but we still need to know which way up it is to be able to get the true acceleration reading. So then we'll get the, the raw acceleration. Then we get gravity. And then we get the linear acceleration. So this is uh, the acceleration after having been adjusted for the gravity vector. And then we get the linear acceleration in a world frame. So this is this one having been adjusted for the rotation of the unit. So it's a, you know slightly complex, but all it means is that the value we're getting at the end, uh, which is this AA world unit, is an acceleration in world space, which is what we're looking for. And then, because um, actually, I don't, uh, I don't mind whether in this case um, the unit gets accelerated along the x-axis or the y-axis or the or the z-axis. I just want to know the the maximum uh, amount it's been accelerated, so that even if you mounted the unit a different way up, let's say, uh, it would still count. So what I'm going to do is I'm first of all going to work out. Okay, so which is bigger? The acceleration in the x-axis or the acceleration in the y-axis? That's going to be that bit. And then I'll take that one and then I'll say, okay, which is bigger out of the biggest of those two? And the acceleration in the z-axis. And whichever is the largest one of those ones will give me the overall largest uh, component of acceleration in, in any one axis. So basically I'm saying whichever, whichever direction it gets hit in, let me take the, the maximum acceleration in that axis from the current reading. And if we're in debug mode, we'll chop that out to the serial link. And then we'll add that uh, latest reading onto the running average. Now again, remember I said you don't strictly need um, to use a running average here. You could take the uh, just the latest reading and plot the LEDs according to the latest reading. But you'll find that the, you know, they jump around a bit. So we'll add it to the running average first of all. And then what we'll do, this line here, so this is the line that um, starts to determine how many LEDs we're going to light up. So I'm using the map function. Now map is a way of um, mapping a range of values um, between one minimum and maximum to another range of values between a minimum and maximum. So I'm going to take uh, the maximum value that's currently in the running average buffer and the way it's stored at the moment, that takes a value that's somewhere between naught and uh, activation force. So the biggest um, force I'm accepting users to enter. And what I want to do instead is I want to map it instead to a, a, range, a value in the range from naught to the number of LEDs instead. So activation force, which is 20,000 at the moment, let's say, so if I map the value 10,000, which is halfway between naught and activation force, what I'd want the result of this uh, method to give me would be the number that's halfway between naught and number of LEDs instead. Um, likewise, if uh, the reading from the sensor was uh, activation force, if it was hit at the maximum allowed value that I want it to be, I'd like the number of LEDs lit to be all of the LEDs. So that's what this map function does, is it, it allows you to scale a range of values 
um, from one range to another range, basically. Uh, that's going to give my LEDs to light. And then just going to make sure, just in case we hit it uh, harder than activation force, and we've kind of gone off the top end of the scale, but we can't, we can't light up more LEDs than we actually have. Um, likewise, if the sensor, let's say the sensor offsets weren't quite um, input correctly, it might be possible to take a negative reading of the current force. And we don't want to light a negative number of LEDs either. So all I'm going to do here is this constrain function here says, OK, well, let's take the LEDs to light and we'll constrain that so that it's only between naught and number of LEDs instead. So it's kind of just like a sense check to say, well, look, we can't light less LEDs than we have. We can't light more LEDs than we have. Either. There's got to be somewhere in that range. Uh, and then this is the function that actually lights the LEDs up. So we just loop over all of them. So zero is going to be the LED at the bottom of the strip. And the num LED, LED is the one at the top. So we're going to loop over all of them in order. And if this LED is uh, less than the LED that we're going to light up to, we'll light it red. So it was below the limit we've reached. If it's above that, we're just going to um, keep it off, basically. So this black just means don't turn it on at all. Uh, fast LED dot show. That's a function that actually pushes the array of LED values to the strip itself and makes them light up. And then right at the end, uh, this function here. Uh, so uh, this is the one that's actually going to tell whether the puzzle has been uh, completed or not, whether the activity has been solved. So if the uh, number of LEDs lit in is uh, greater than or equal to the number of LEDs minus one, so we've effectively got to the top of the scale, what we'll do is we'll send a high signal to that relay pin. That's going to uh, activate the relay, make that common connection flip over to the normally closed. And when it does, it's going to release the maglock. And then this is going to be a, a latched puzzle solution. So once it's been done correctly, um, we'll just enter an infinite loop here. So while true, which will always be true, we're just going to delay. So the code at this point is just going to hang and go round and round in circles. And that is the uh, end of the main code listing.